John Leonard is the Samuel C. Collins Professor of Mechanical and Ocean Engineering in the MIT Department of Mechanical Engineering. He's also a member of uh, MIT CSAIL. He is an expert in navigation and mapping for autonomous robots, developing techniques to handle uncertainty in sensing and actuation. He was team leader for MIT's DARPA Urban Challenge team, which was one of 11 teams to qualify for the Urban Challenge final event, and one of six teams to complete the race. He's a recipient of an NSF Career Award, an ETS Walton Visitor Award from the, National Sci from the Science Foundation of Ireland. Uh, Professor Leonard, I'm um, a consultant, sorry, I'll talk a lot about it. Okay, yes, he serves as a, uh, a consultant with the Autonomous Driving Research at uh, Toyota Research Institute, working on uh, research to improve vehicle safety using autonomous driving techniques. Thanks everybody for this chance to speak to you and thanks for that um, introduction. I, um, I want to tell you about research in robotics uh, and autonomy related to self-driving cars. And I find myself saying a lot of times I feel like the luckiest person in the world being on the faculty getting to work with amazing students and colleagues and postdocs. And the, in the past few years, since 2016, I went on a sabbatical for a couple years working with Toyota to help launch its self-driving car program. And I'm still involved as a technical advisor. And so I want to try to give you a sort of a, a view of kind of like my personal journey with self-driving cars. And I, um, I'll warn you that I'm a bit of a contrarian. I think it's going to take a lot longer than people might say. And in fact, uh, if you had gone back four or five years ago, there was a lot of hype, say in 2015, 2016. And I was one of the people saying, wait, it's going to take a lot longer. So I'm going to try to explain to you why. But in the long term, I, I still think that we can make cars safer and we can improve mobility for all. So um, a little bit of a sound check. This is a, this is a video of our DARPA Urban Challenge vehicle in 2007. Uh, we competed with uh, a bunch of other teams uh, in a race where it was $2 million for first place, $1 million for second place, half a million dollars for third place, nothing for fourth place, remember that. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and back then in 2007, we had some challenges with our, we tried to navigate more using perception, having a robot that used its, its, its sensors to try to build in a, in a sense, sort of build a local model of the world and drive relative to that model. And, and one of the big things that, that's happened uh, since then, uh, there's been a revolution in computer vision uh, using deep learning, machine learning techniques. And so just a little example here, this is a picture of an image from, from Cambridge. This is uh, from Hampshire Street. I think a lot about making left turns. So just driving in the Boston, Cambridge area. I live in Newton. Um, I'll give you some driving examples, uh, things that I think are hard for self-driving cars. What's become kind of easy today is what's called semantic segmentation, where you can take an image like this, and a computer vision algorithm trained with deep networks can pick out that's a car, those are pedestrians, those are trees, there's drivable road surface. And it would be easy to be tempted to say, oh, it's all like right ahead of us, that, that self-driving is coming. But there are big challenges remain, and I'll try to talk about some of those. So, has anyone seen any news articles on autonomous driving lately? <laughs> uh, years ago, I remember talking at a visiting committee meeting for Ocean Engineering 20 years ago, where I used like ro articles about robots to, for a talk, and uh, I had to go back like over the past few months. But in self-driving, there's articles every day. And so just a few recent ones, uh, is anyone, so this is Waymo. Waymo was Google's self-driving car spin out. They're far ahead of everyone else, and they, they really, it's a tremendous story the whole history of the Google Car project. So now they're, they're talking about operations in Los Angeles. I think if anyone who's a Hollywood movie producer, someone should make a movie about the early days of the Google Car project. I think it has drama and excitement, and, and uh, it, it's sort of this magical thing that happened. Um, and, uh, the, uh, and Waymo is talking about truly driverless operations in, in the Bay Area. Uh, in my Toyota life, I go to Silicon Valley a lot, and so I've sort of gotten to experience sort of California, and that sort of, uh, uh, I feel really privileged, but also, um, yeah, I'll come back to that. <laughs> yeah. And closer to home, this is a startup called Optimus Ride, which is an MIT spinoff in South uh, Boston, and uh, the, uh, these are smaller shuttles for mobility, where instead of trying to replace an Uber driver, the goal is to sort of augment public transit with smaller low-speed vehicles. Uh, and they've been quite successful. 
Uh, another, um, so in venture capital, the, the amount of investment is just stunning because of the size of the opportunity. If you could truly disrupt transportation, you really could change, uh, uh, change the world. And so Zooks is one of those startups in California that are doing very well and have obtained massive event investment. Uh, they're going to operate in Las Vegas. And of course we have Elon Musk, and so I have like tremendous awe and respect and admiration for Elon Musk. I just don't agree with his notion of time in terms of future. <laughs> um, but um, Elon's promised a truly self-driving Tesla in 2020, um, and he said that drivers would be able to fall asleep and wake up at their destinations using full self-drive by the end of 2020. Um, and I'm, uh, I, we'll see. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, and sort of the hype was sort of that peak hype back in uh, sort of for the Gartner hype curve. This was February 2018. Someone said, in the past five years, autonomous driving has gone from maybe possible to definitely possible to inevitable to how did anyone ever think this wasn't inevitable? I think it's not, I, it's not inevitable. Um, and um, so, so a poll question, if, if we weren't, if it wasn't a dinner, if you were MIT undergrads, I would ask you to take out your smartphones and use my polling app and say, when do you think you'd be able to arrive from MIT airport to Logan in a fully driverless car? And so, just by the like, show of hands, who, who thinks in three years you'll be able to leave a building like this, E52, and take a fully driverless car to Logan Airport? Three years? Okay. Uh, anyone think within, say, eight years? Okay. How about within about 15 years? Anyone say more than 15 years? <laughs> and, uh, because um, you know you have tunnel, you have congestion, and so how about in any weather conditions? How about um, any weather conditions where Logan is in, Logan Airport is open? Do you think that? Um, and so, so what I'm going to do in my in my talk, and, and I and I always have way too much material, and I just sort of let it rip, and just you know we'll see how it goes. Um, but I'll tell you sort of my personal self-driving journey. Um, some history and challenges of autonomous driving, and I want to tell you about our work, at, the work that I've been involved with with Toyota, where they have something called the Guardian approach, which sort of complements the chauffeur approach, um, and some demos of Guardian, and then some thoughts on the future of linking it back to uh, research concepts, um, where we can try to use machine learning and, and robot navigation. Um, so, but most of the talks actually going to be my sort of this personal story and journey and looking back at the DARPA uh, grand challenge. So, I went, I grew up in Philadelphia, I went to UPenn undergrad, uh, got to go to Oxford for my PhD. I was admitted to Course 6 for grad school, um, but I, but as a TA and I had a fellowship to go to Oxford, so I, you are part of an exclusive club as alums that I'll never be a part of, and that makes me sad that I don't have a degree from MIT, but I did come here in 1991, uh, and it really, you know, feel truly changed my life. Um, so I started at MIT working on autonomous underwater vehicles. So underwater, you don't get GPS, it's very hard to communicate, uh, and the, um, their emissions for the Navy, for offshore oil, for, for science, where you want robots to have the ability to build map, maps and navigate. And so I've actually, I say that my major at MIT is robotics, and my minor is the anthropology of MIT. I've, I've been involved in uh, the Sea Grant program, the Ocean Engineering, Course 13, um, rest in peace, and uh, Course 2, Mechanical Engineering, uh, the AI Lab, which merged with LCS to make CSAIL. I've been the co-director of the Ford MIT Alliance. I'm part of the task force on work of the future. I feel like I have friends now all over campus, and it's just wonderful to be involved in, in such an amazing community. I teach uh, measurement and instrumentation uh, in, in course two, electronics and robotics. Um, uh, and I, um, my research is about something called SLAM. So raise your hand if you've heard of SLAM. It's a simultaneous localization of mapping. So the goal is to build a map and use the map to navigate. Um, it's sort of a fundamental competence of mobile robots. This is a video post-processing of a robot with stereo vision being navigated around the Stata Center. Uh, and what it's doing is using stereo vision to try to build a map, a 3D model, and estimate its motion. And you'll see in a second when the robot sort of goes down the corridor to the right. The thing about navigation is your error, your dead reckoning has uh, a drift. And so you can see as the robot goes down the corridor and turns back around, it's as if there were two different corridors that are misaligned. But by recognizing some landmarks and doing what we call loop closing, the robot can correct the map. And so it's really about applying the laws of uh, using uncertainty and inference to try to collect data from many vantage points to build a model of the world. 
And that's what I started to try to do in my PhD. A bunch of other folks were trying this around the world. I actually called it simultaneous localization and map building in my thesis, which, uh, sorry, simultaneous map building and localization in my thesis, which if you make an acronym would be SMALL, S-M-A-L. And after I left Oxford, my advisor was writing grant proposals, and he, changed, he said SMALL is a terrible acronym when you're <laughs> so, so, so SLAM is a very forceful acronym. And, um, so the, the, uh, it's sort of a which came first, the chicken or the egg problem. Because if you had a map, you could estimate your motion. And if you knew your motion and your positions, you could build a map. And so how you sort of do that by, at the same time is sort of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. And so if you have a map, then you can locate yourself very accurately. And the whole question of how do people and animals navigate, or um, even recently I've been, I think SLAM is everywhere. SLAM is ubiquitous. We're, I even recently, so, uh, Megan mentioned Vlad Bolovich is going to talk about MIT Nano. I spoke for them about a week and a half ago. And uh, I think it's possible to do SLAM at the nanoscale for like cryo EM to try to like reconstruct the shape of molecules. I think if you think about taking multiple observations of different, from different vantage points and fusing it all together, there's sort of a, an inference problem there. So uh, anyway, so way back in, in Oxford in 1987, 89, we had some of the first Sun workstations in, in Oxford. I learned to program. You can see there, and next to me was a box. Um, anyone recognize that kind of box? It's, you do, awesome. Do you know what it's called? Uh, 370. Well, that, Maybe field one. So that's a, that's a data cube. Oh, that's a data cube. Okay. To the left. So data cube was an early vision processing thing that cost about $100,000, and it could do edge detection at about three frames a second with very, very tricky programming. Uh, and. Um, the, uh, and so what, what I use sonar, so uh, that's probably how I wound up doing underwater stuff later. So I had a little robot built in France that had Polaroid ultrasonic ranging sensors on it. And the goal was to have the robot navigate around and use a model to, to, to locate itself, kind of using the geometry of the world as beacons. So if you were sailing and you were using lighthouses or other landmarks, so how, how could a robot sort of navigate through the world detecting and, and localizing landmarks? And um, so that was my, 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 I was in a little basement in Oxford and, and, and just like scratched the surface on this problem. I got the chance to come to MIT and I, you know, I truly, I truly found paradise. <laughs> Do you know that? Okay. Uh, uh, you didn't go to MIT, ask your spouse, actually. Uh, uh, our partner was the guest. Uh, anyway, so um, I started at MIT in the secret program yeah. at Kendall Square. And, um, but I, I, didn't, I sort of fell in love with the interconnected buildings and corridors. So if you're a robot doing SLAM, one of the hard challenges is doing loop closing. So one of the things we did in 2002 was we navigated around the third floor of the infinite corridor and we built a map of, of a, we call it the Killian Court data set. It's actually a pretty famous data set in SLAM. Um, but we also do a lot of experiments in the river. Was anyone here sailing when you were here? Anyone was sailing? And, and so, uh, we have this wonderful relationship with the sailing pavilion where they let us stick our robots in the water. So in 1992-3, I was like doing underwater robots in the river as a postdoc. Now we have an autonomy bay in, in the new sailing pavilion where we, we have classes. And so underwater vehicles are a whole other story. It's really cool. Um, I was in, uh, one of the important vehicles is called Remus. It was developed at Woods Hole where we have a joint program that I'm involved with. This was one of my master's students, his name is Chris Cassidy. He was actually a Navy SEAL, one of the first SEALs to deploy to Afghanistan after 9-11. He then became an astronaut, went to space twice, once on the space shuttle, once for six months on the space station, he was coming out of the astronaut corps. And uh, he was involved with just trying to program this robot and help it to, to navigate. Um, this is from an experiment we did with NATO in Italy where we deployed multiple vehicles underwater and we had kayaks as autonomous service robots to sort of serve as navigation beacons. And, um, the, uh, I, I apologize for bragging about our students, but really, as a professor, our product are our students, and what they wind up doing later is just amazing. And even students that sometimes struggle or sometimes get a little off course, it's just amazing 10, 20, 30 years how they're, they're leaders in industry, in the military, and various things. And so if you think about SLAM, this, this um, um, you know, trying to build a map of the world, one of the first questions is representation. How do you represent the world so in terms of geometry, appearance, um, do you, uh, and, and so there's a whole rich set of different questions you could ask. And then you have an inference problem of how you combine lots of sensor data with uncertainty. And then finally, how you build systems and connect it to path planning and make it autonomous. And so that, if I gave a research talk, in a way, like I, 
I've had 23 PhD students that I've advised or co-advised, and everyone is sort of populating some part of this space, you know, trying in a complicated environment, trying with different sensors. Um, one of the, uh, doing things underwater, uh, we tend to use, we have to use sonar because vision is so poor. This is an example of a project for the Navy where they wanted to be able to, to map and reacquire objects on the floor like mines or other objects of interest where you could use expensive vehicles to map an area and lower cost vehicles to go back and reacquire them. So that's kind of a little taste of what we do in our, in our research. Um, but I'm going to switch gears now to talk about self-driving the rest of the time. And for me, this self-driving, the DARPA Urban Challenge, was sort of a, uh, uh, it was an opportunity. It was uh, it's just this sort of crazy event that took over our lives. And I had really close faculty colleagues. So even though I was nominally the team leader, um, Seth Teller, the late Seth Teller, my dear friend, uh, Jonathan Howe, Amelia Frixoli, wonderful faculty colleagues, we worked together. And this is a little clip from, we were part of a reality-style TV show. And it was sort of a Woodstock of robotics. So I'll just give a little flavor. This is the world's toughest robot race. The U.S. government has challenged the civilian robotics community to create a car that can drive itself. This is just about the hardest thing you can do to a autonomous vehicle. Despite the long odds of winning, more than 80 teams have jumped at the chance. The biggest challenge is dealing with the unexpected. <laughs> the finals, a two million dollar prize is at stake. Which RoboCar will be first to the future? When robots That's our car. That was one of our students. <laughs> that wasn't our car. So one of us is built and get out of the car. The roughest race without drivers is about to begin. <laughs> <laughs> that car was somebody who, um, believe it or not, he, he won a lot of money in Jeopardy. And he used his Jeopardy winnings to buy a truck for the 2005 Urban Challenge and then the next year. Um, so, so anyway, um, sorry. So, so here's our team, one of our team photos, and uh, we had a collection of postdocs, grad students. One of the things that DARPA, DARPA gave us a million dollar grant to do this, and one of the things that appealed to them was we really tried to bridge the different parts of MIT. So we had Aero Astro and CCL and Mecky all kind of working together. And to be honest, uh, from a... Uh, it was some of the most stressful times in my life in terms of the relate, managing the interpersonal connections between very strong world programmers and, and folks that are very sort of more formal and aerostro and it's really a, and, and so uh, you know and um, but at the end of the day we somehow pulled through it and we um, we used a sensor on the top this is called a Velodyne laser scanner uh, it was a brand new sensor developed uh, for the challenge by a company that makes loudspeakers uh, Velodyne and uh, it's, uh, this is driving down Mass Ave. It gives you a million data points a second, and you can see people and trees and buildings and the road surface, and it, and it, it really is sort of a remarkable sensor. Um, by the way, it cost $75,000 then, um, uh, approximately. What do you think it costs today? $75,000. So, so one of the questions I ask is, you know, when will self-driving technology be cheap enough you know, to deploy a massive scale? And so getting a cheap LiDAR is a big thing that you know, a lot of investment is pursued, but uh, it's surprisingly hard to, to make them. Um, and so we used a, a radical new path planner called a randomized uh, random tree uh, path planner, which Emilia Frizzoli and John Howe led the implementation of. Uh, and um, the robot made a local map of the world and then used uh, lots of compute, computation to, to 10 times a second generate, say, 50 random paths and try to pick the best one. And our robot um, tried to not rely on GPS so much. So DARPA let us finish the race, but we had a few incidents uh, along the way, and, um, which I'll show you. So um, um, we also had Dave Barrett, who's an MIT alum. We built the RoboTuner. He's a professor at Owen College. Some old students helped build our, our vehicle. And, when, our, when we deployed our robot, we just had to basically wait, we'd get it back, we'd review the data logs, and it was this really just intense um, experience. And to the, to, the, to the sort of VCs, I've been told that some of these pictures, they're almost like oil paintings where like, you know, you can pick out, you know, all right, so, so Sertash is now a ten tenured professor here. Uh, Ed, uh, he has a startup, Optimus. Ed is tenured at Michigan. He has a startup. Um, and uh, this guy, Yoshi, He's one of the engineers that landed the barges, uh, sorry, 
landed the rockets for Elon Musk at SpaceX back on the barges and on land. So he's, he's one of a small group of MIT alums leading the uh, uh, reentry and landing problem for, uh, for SpaceX. Um, so, and our students were really leaders, you know, we're sort of hanging on by our fin fingernails in some ways. They, they wrote, uh, Ed and Albert and David wrote some open source, some code we open sourced for how robot processes communicate to each other called LCM. LCM, Lightweight Communications and Marshalling, and it's used in many of the top self-driving startups and efforts. Um, and uh, our robot had more sensors and computers than any other robot. Seth really wanted to not be limited. Um, we had our, our, um, our computer system was donated to us by Quanta Computer. It was 3.8 kilowatt, kilowatts fully powered. It was a blade cluster with 40 cores, which was a lot for the time. We had a, uh, a two kilowatt air conditioner on the roof to cool it, and a six kilowatt RV genset in the back to power it. So it was sort of a thermal disaster. Um, at the end of the day, um, Carnegie Mellon came in first, Stanford second, Virginia Tech third, we came in fourth place. Um, but uh, we, um, our students were the prize, you know, in terms of what they've gone and done. And one of the things that happened to us is, anyone here a Cornell grad? Um, okay. so, we had a little incident with Cornell. They uh, had been, we spent about four minutes to try to pass them. They were stopping and starting. Do you want to crank this up if you can? Let's check in once again. Okay. It's a boss. So this is about five hours into the six hour race. That's Carnegie Mellon who won. Second vehicle to cross the line. At the so end. we were trying to, each vehicle had a chase car. Virginia Tech. Where someone could press an emergency stop. Oh, so we got a issue. Here's a 26 so we're, we're 79. It's like they're and, and it looks like they're, the, the 79 is trying to pass and has passed the chase vehicle for Skynet, the 26 vehicle. Wow. And, Tal he's gonna, and Talos is going to pass. Very aggressive. Crash <laughs> <laughs> turn one. Oh boy. That is, you know, that's a bold maneuver. <laughs> And I'm sure the, uh, the guys run. So, so what happened? Okay, so with a, um, with a self-driving car, you can sort of look inside the brain of the vehicle and say, what, what, what the, what's going on? So the vehicle has this local model of the world, and uh, the different colors mean things like uh, uh, obstacles, forbidden regions, or places you could transit through. But the big thing is computer vision technology wasn't really ready in 2007. So the semantic segmentation result I showed you at the beginning of the talk, that didn't exist then. And um, so even though we can see that's a car, the road surface is very wide, our robot was using LiDAR, and to the LiDAR it's just a, blunt, a bunch of points. And um, so as it turned out we had four or five bugs, and Cornell had four or five bugs that interacted in this somewhat strange way to cause this behavior. So even when we planned a path around the car, but because it was moving so slowly, we never classified it as a dynamic object. That was the critical bug. And uh, even when we tried to slam on the brakes, our emergency stop behavior turned the steering wheel straight and turned us into it. And so DARPA actually froze all the vehicles and they said, who was at fault? And they said, well, kind of both of them. So they let us continue, because by then five robots had already crashed out of the race and they wanted more people to finish. <laughs> <laughs> so they had to But um, so at that time in 2008, we, um, we traded our data logs with Cornell and we uh, wrote a, a journal article um, about this collision and a few other incidents that weren't as much in public view. And so it was basically a, like a 38-page peer-reviewed accident report. <laughs> one thing I'll note is that one of the faculty in the Cornell team yeah. is Dan Huttenlocker, who's our new dean. So my, my Huttenlocker number is one. Um, and, uh, the, uh, but, but it's not a good thing when you crashed into your dean's <laughs> anyway, And if you look in our code, what I, the critical thing, I'm sorry, like, this is some C code here, um, the velocity magnitude of the track had to be greater than three seconds, and the track maturity had to be greater than eight time steps. So, say, like, you know, uh, call that uh, two tenths of a second, probably. And, and then you would call it a car. So, if you knew something was a car, you would assume it could move and then not try to go in front of it. But if you assume everything is a car, potentially a car, slowly moving obstacles, your robot gets too timid and it won't actually move because. Due to the aperture problem, as you move through the world, mm -hmm. just moving causes things to shift and change. And, uh, and so actually slowly moving obstacles are really hard to deal with, even today. Okay, but my uh, very fond memories, you know, it was Halloween, uh, you know, we had a pumpkin on top of our car, and late nights with me and Ed and Luke, you know, hacking code and changing parameters in the car. Uh, and that was 2007, 
So um, if you go back in time and say, what are the people doing now? So, so Ed has a very successful startup. Saratash has a startup. Emilio and Carl, they sold their startup for $450 million to Delphi, which is now Aptiv. Um, Luke Fletcher uh, from Australia, who's on our team as a postdoc, is now part of the group at Toyota. And I'll show you some of the work we did together a bit later. Um, and uh, so this is Optimus. They were in the New York Times recently. They're operating in, in uh, Brooklyn. Uh, and Main Mobility are doing really well. They, they, they're operating in Rhode Island. They got pulled over their first day of operations by a police officer. They did nothing wrong. The police officer was just curious. What was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, so anyway, that's sort of how I wound up at this point. Um, so uh, it turns out, so I was very skeptical of self-driving. Just the timelines were a little too aggressive. And, so uh, let me, let me, here's how I describe it. So, so for me, back in 2009, you know, Star Drive, Logan Airport, Snow, forget it. It's going to take a long time. But Google surprised us all. And uh, the article came out in October 2010. John Markoff, the um, New York Times reporter in Silicon Valley, broke the story that Google were driving in traffic, uh, driving autonomously. At this point, they'd driven 140,000 miles autonomously. So Google had secretly hired some of the best engineers from the top two urban challenge teams. And they had a secret project where they always had a safety driver ready to take over, and they were driving around the Bay Area, 101 and various kind of things. And um, the, uh, to the Google founders, it was just like this amazing time. They founded Google X, the moonshot. And, uh, and the promise, and they did a video taking a visually impaired man, Steve Mann, to uh, Taco Bell in a driverless car. Just, it got six million hits in a week. And it's just stunning to think about the transformation to mobility that you could have with driverless technology. Um, and I, in fact, got to ride in the, one of the Google car and Lexus prototypes in 2014. And I wrote on Facebook, I felt like I was at the beach at Kitty Hawk. You know, the performance of the car was really flawless for like a 15, 20 minute drive through Mountain View. Um, my student, Ross, he actually dropped out of the PhD program after five or six years because uh, he did a startup that uh, he went to Y Combinator. And after about a year in existence, he got, um, his startup got acquired by Niantic Labs to do Multiplayer Pokemon Go using Slack. <laughs> so, so now he's uh, he got a twenty-five thousand dollar gift from the MIT Sandbox program to do a startup, and now he's giving money back. Uh, to, 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 so I wish he could finish his PhD, but this uh, come back. So the potential benefits, why it's such a big um, opportunity. Safety is what really gets me awake in the morning. I think like we have the potential to really make cars so much safer, um, and. Sadly, we have over 30,000 fatalities in the U.S. each year, over a million worldwide. Um, and beyond safety, you can think about increasing the efficiency of the road network. Maybe your commute is still highly congested, but you can watch a movie, you can do some, do some work. You can imagine what would be the value if you took all the parking lots in cities and, changed, uh, and made those parks and made those apartments. Um, you can imagine totally new models for how goods and people and services move through the world. And, and a lot of this sort of predated Uber and the whole transformation of, like, of mobility on demand. Um, and so there is obviously a lot of potential change. Um, but there are a lot of challenges too. And so to me there's a long list of challenges. The technology, which I'll mostly talk about because that's you know, what I think about, but also you know, what is the impact on jobs? Uh, how would it affect economies? Um, you know, you can, there's this something called the trolley problem in terms of the whole ethics, of which, I, which I don't know how to answer, uh, but you can ask it anyway, and uh, the legal sort of implications, cybersecurity and the whole effect of energy uh, in the environment. And so I have a list of some of the sort of key challenges. Before I do that, I just want to review the, have you heard of the SAE levels for self-driving? So, uh, so a level one system is just a single degree of freedom, like say adaptive cruise control. Um, level two is automation of two or more functions, and so it requires that you have to be ready for handoff at a moment's notice. So the Tesla autopilot is a really good example of level two. Even though they call it autopilot and people have done crazy things on videos, you really have to be ready to take over at a moment's notice. Level three is conditional automation, is when the car will do all of the driving and give you some notice period. So it might say, 10 seconds from now, you have to take over because you're approaching your exit. And so level three can be particularly problematic because um, the system has to kind of know when it's leaving its operating area or know that it's not performing properly. And then level four or, is when the human really is only a passenger. Uh, and uh, at least in a geolocated, geofenced area in level four, 
that the car does all the driving, and level five is truly driverless, perhaps with even no person in the car, the car like going around looking for rides on its own. And um, the different levels define sort of different technology and human factors, gaps, and sometimes when they get conflated by the media, it gets confusing. Um, so for me, uh, one of the things, like, so I, I live in Newton, it's about eight miles away. Uh, um, I, so what I did was I, let's see, the way I like to describe this, and uh, uh, let's see if this is going to work. Uh, I'll do this one second, I'll just try. Okay, uh, back before I got involved with Toyota, I was sort of a neutral person that journalists would come to and ask questions, and so I was interviewed for the MIT, sorry for all these words, but I was interviewed by the Tech Review uh, about the Google project or, and, and similar, and I said, wait a second, you know, there's major unsolved difficulties here. We still might be decades behind humans. And at this point in my life, I had never heard of Reddit. <laughs> and so I was Googling this article, uh, and this page came up, the Reddit self-driving cars page, which is a wonderful source of knowledge. And this person, Walkie22Talkie, who I've never met, this anonymous person who's truly wonderful, all he does is post driverless car articles all day long. And he said, you know, one of the things I said was, I, I do not expect there to be taxis in Manhattan with no drivers in my lifetime. And he said, talk about a Debbie Downer who's not even 15 years old. And I was 49. Okay. I also said that, um, uh, I had just come back from a trip to Germany, and I was taking a lot of taxis in Berlin, and various, I'm very impressed by the German taxi drivers and the complexity of the world. And, uh, and I said, you know, I don't want to see taxi drivers out of business. They know where they're going, and at least in Europe, they're courteous and safe. My wife said to me, what do you have against American taxi drivers? <laughs> but, uh, and, they, um, and so this person said, sounds more like someone that's afraid of the technology and has trust issues with machines. <laughs> and so, I do have trust issues with machines. I build robots for a living, I know what's wrong. So this, so this triggered me to try to defend my honor. I started collecting dash cam data for my commuting in Boston. So I bought a dash cam on Amazon, and for about a month I collected all my commuting data from moving back and forth different routes. And in fact, but the first example I'm going to show you of a difficult Boston situation, sorry for that out of sequence, is a left turn across traffic. So this is actually a cell phone video of a seventh grader in the passenger seat. And it was a bitter cold day, it was February of 2013, and there was, uh, there are two middle schools, a high school, and two elementary schools within a half a mile of this intersection. <laughs> and they just changed the traffic pattern on Route 9, uh, putting in the lights. And so I'm trying to make a left turn, and there's a mailbox, a tree, a telephone pole, cars coming pretty fast. And to the right, there's cars as far as the eye can see in terms of congestion. So, um, and so, the way that I was able to do it, you can't see the video, is I waved at another driver, she nodded, she sort of made a gap, and, and I went in. And this is sort of like the social ballet of driving, how you sort of communicate or make decisions. Um, this is in uh, Coolidge Corner in Brookline, and so what you're going to see is there's a, a police officer directing traffic with flashing lights. You have to know, what should a self-driving car do with flashing lights? You know, do you pull over? What do you do? But here, a police officer is waving me to go through a red light. So is anyone here a computer programmer? How do you write the code that says always stop at red lights unless there's a man on the side of the road who's a police officer who's, who's waving you to go through the red light? Uh, and then the next intersection, the police officer is going to stop me at a green light. <laughs> and, uh, so those sort of human interactions, crossing guards, traffic cops. Um, same intersection, just different time of the year. You know, what do you see in this picture? Do you see the traffic lights? Do you see the sun? Do you see the legs of the police officer? Stand this is the police officer that's in the yellow vest. Here's the shadows of his legs. I need to clean my windscreen. Um, and uh, he was actually, he walked across me and was waving pedestrians uh, across, even though I was blinded by the sun. And, um, and this is, anyone recognize where this is? Yeah, Massa, there's Massa. Or for some of you, Ashdown. Um, uh, and Snow is difficult not just because of the change to traction and affecting sensing range and false positives and so forth, but um, if you if you dig back and dig down to how a self-driving car actually works, it turns out so it's been said that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. I believe Arthur C. Clarke said that. But magicians don't always reveal their secrets, and so. Part of my story is to tell you some of the secrets behind the magic tricks. And 
one of the secrets is to use SLAM, or to make very accurate maps down to centimeter level accuracy, and then to locate the car relative to those very accurate maps. By knowing your position down to centimeters of, of precision, you can predict what you should see. You can look for a particular pixel to look for a traffic light. You can um, know where pedestrians are likely to be. You still need to react to other pedestrians. Um, and you just have this general sense that everything's okay. And, and so, um, if you go back to the Google car, and by the way, I have just amazing respect for the Google you know, Waymo project. This is a video they released around the time that I rode in the car. This is in Mountain View. Um, this is the kind of map that they build in advance. So what you see is this, this sort of gray, gray color, the mapping the reflectivity of the LiDAR off of the road surface, and it lets them position the car very accurately by matching the current LiDAR scan to the previous map. When they make the maps, they can have a human check the map and say, oh, the map is correct. And they do things like you know, deviate around cones, which is very impressive, respond to pedestrians, avoid you know, other cars, but the, uh, the map is critical to the operation of the car. If you turn a robot loose with no map, it suddenly it can't navigate confidently. And so, so my sort of summary of the big sort of technical questions, maintaining those maps. So what if the world changes? So this picture here is uh, one day uh, I was walking across Massad Bridge, taking the tea from, uh, and, uh, from Kendall, uh, Kenmore walking, and uh, the road surface was repaved when they added the bike lanes. That was in 2013. And what if suddenly the road surface changed? What if suddenly the road surface covered with snow? Then you lose that ability to navigate. Um, interacting with people, at least until, you know, some folks would say, especially in Silicon Valley, well, what if all the cars are robot cars? We wouldn't need the police officer. Or why don't you just give the police officer an app for their cell phone to tell them to stop cars? <laughs> Maybe that will work. But, you know, I think that the interacting with other drivers is, is really hard. And then, a really big challenge is just getting robust performance, robust computer vision. If anyone knows what an ROC curve is, like a receiver operating characteristic curve, where you want to say, what's the, uh, or you have it all the time in medicine, like different outcomes, what's the probability of detection versus the probability of false alarms, how do you sort of set the thresholds? And so for, for level two and level three, like Tesla autopilot, the big challenge is, is the human ready to take control when necessary? There's something called the vigilance decrement problem. If the car does like 99% of the driving, you're, you're going to have trouble being ready to take it on the 1% when it needs it. And in fact, the history of self-driving, Google uh, have talked now a lot more about what they were doing six, seven years ago. They did a pilot for their employees with the Lexus prototypes where they had 140 employees use the cars for weeks or months at a time. These were not members of the team. They were just random Googlers. And it's kind of stunning in hindsight. They had a, just had the employee all by themselves in the car, some video monitoring. They said to them, uh, you have to promise to pay attention. They said, I promise I'll pay attention. <laughs> uh, but the, the examples they told us about four or five years ago was that uh, people would do their makeup, people would like pull a backpack from the back seat, and their phone, cell phone was dead, they'd open up their laptop, they'd plug their phone into their laptop, they'd check their email. Um, people do that while they're driving now. I know. <laughs> but, um, but what they admitted last year was actually that um, in their trial that somebody fell asleep for 27 minutes on 101, going uh, 60 miles an hour. And so, and so the, uh, they've actually just released a video from some of these things in the last few months, actually. John Kraftschick showed it a few weeks ago uh, in, in, Ger in Germany. And so, um, and it's well known from aviation and from other contexts that people are really bad at monitoring autonomous systems. So then you might say, well, level four, that's why Google went to level four, to take away the reliance on the human. But then you really need near perfect detection in a wide variety of, of settings. And so, um, as a way of describing this, uh, we had visitors from uh, Daimler, from Mercedes Research, about seven years ago in CCL. They were doing early work on computer vision assisted uh, uh, emergency braking. And they said that our goal is to set the system to be. 80% detection with only one false alarm every 100,000 kilometers. This is for a driver assist system. Mm -hmm. And I raised my hand and I said, that's four out of five pedestrians. What about the other one out of five? Why don't you try for 19 out of 20? And I said, well, if we change to 19 out of 20, then maybe we're going to have one false alarm every 1,000 kilometers. <laughs> like maybe it's a paper bag or a pothole and the car is going to suddenly slam on the brakes and the driver will spill their coffee or and they'll bring the car back to the dealer and say, my car is broken, fix it. 
and how does the dealer fix it? You know, and so the reality is that if it's a driver assistance system in a sort of do no harm sense, you know, it is actually a valid product to have something that will do four out of five uh, with a very low false alarm rate. But for the full level four self-driving car, you need five out of five, or you need, you know, 99.999999%, and that's just really hard. Um, and so an example of computer vision, I talked about the semantic segmentation. This is actually from the same data set. This is from a, a TRI researcher, Simon Stent, using an algorithm from a, a researcher at Intel named Vladimir Colton on um, Fisher U at Berkeley. Um, this is a video of a, an image of a truck, and, I sh and the segmentic, segmentation algorithm works really well for like cars and trees. What does it think of this truck? Well, it actually thinks that um, this, it's calling rider slash person, <laughs> Uh, and then the sign, it thinks it's a fence. So if you squint your eyes, you can sort of see the fence from the letters. Yeah. Uh, and so you can see that this is three or four years old, and with more and more data, these algorithms are, are getting better and better. But a lot of times, vision algorithms judge their performance on sort of mean average precision, like say 95%, and getting like really high performance is really hard. Okay, so, um, and, uh, all right, so what, so I know that was uh, a lot of material I gave you. The rest part's gonna go more quickly. I'm gonna tell you my little, my Toyota sabbatical, what we're trying to work on, uh, and then definitely have time for questions. Uh, so, but everyone okay so far? Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right, so, um, so Gil Pratt is an MIT alum, former MIT faculty member, very proud graduate of Senior House, uh, and very sad, I think, about Senior House not uh, being closed. But uh, I love Gil, he's been really inspirational to me. He's the CEO of Toyota Research Institute. Uh, and Gil was previously the DARPA Robotics Challenge Program Manager. So he was involved in 2015 in an effort to build uh, robots that could do a disaster response task. And Gil, um, before TRI was announced, he talked about you know, Toyota's approach a little different, where you could think about a car that could be more of a guardian angel. So we, now we call it sort of Toyota Guardian, or just Guardian. And the goal is to enhance the fun of driving while making it far more safe. And, and so, so Toyota Research Institute was, Toyota came late to the self-driving um, in the area. And it's a long story, but the, the tradition in the company, the president of Toyota, Akio Toyota, is a professional race car driver. And there's this whole notion of you love your car and the sort of relationship <coughs> with your car. And how, um, uh, you know, the, uh, we, Toyota was actually, so Akio was actually approached by, uh, Toyota's big sponsor of the Olympics and the Paralympics, and he was approached by Paralympic athletes who asked him personally, please give us better mobility. And I think that was one of the things that moved Toyota <coughs> to more actively embrace autonomy. But we want to do it in a safety first kind of way. So TRI was launched uh, in January 2016. I was one of the first six uh, staff and uh, uh, on leave from MIT. We've got a location near Cambridge, about five minutes walk from here in Ann Arbor, and our headquarters in, in uh, Los Altos, just, just to, uh, down the street from Palo Alto. And uh, this is from a, about a year ago at an all hands in Michigan. So we grew from six people to over 200. About 60% of those folks are working on autonomous driving, 30% on robotics to help elderly people age in place, and 10% on uh, AI for material science uh, discovery. And uh, so there's Gil, Kelly's our senior vice president, uh, executive vice president. This guy, Ryan Eustace, he was actually, I was his co-advisor. He was in the MIT Woods Hole Joint Program. He was a grad student with uh, Hanu Singh, who's now in Northeastern. And Ryan was an underwater roboticist. And he, he had a real home run research result of mapping the Titanic using computer vision data uh, that won awards. And it's actually, underwater <laughs> robotics is a good training ground for self-driving because it gives you a certain way of thinking about when things go wrong and how to engineer things. And so, what does it take to build an automated driving team? And I feel really uh, fortunate to sort of help create this and hopefully you know, ultimately deploy safer products. So you need to build cars, so vehicle hardware, vehicle software, safety and system engineering, mapping and localization, prediction, perception, planning and control. Uh, for the Guardian application where we want to augment the driver, we need to know what the driver's doing. So we need to say, is the driver paying attention? Is the driver falling asleep? We call it driver risk assessment, the ability to sort of predict, like, does this driver see that pedestrian? Uh, machine learning is sort of like an underlying technology. Everything sort of runs on data. Uh, simulation is vital to try to um, explore many, many scenarios. Uh, everything involves cloud data processing, lots of data that's moved around the cloud. 
how you make the user experience good, and finally, we have a vehicle operations, safety drivers that take the vehicles out on public roads. Uh, and so it's a pretty amazing sort of uh, enterprise. And so I've gone from being a grad student that wrote all the code, postdoc that only me and one other person wrote all the code, DARPA challenge team, we had a dozen people writing code, and now we're you know, order of 100 people writing code. It's very different processes and so forth. And just a little glimpse of some of our people. So like Matt leads our vehicle engineering. He's a, a, a DARPA challenge vet from WPI. AJ um, from, from SpaceX, Cigar from Zooks, Ryan Walcott from Michigan is my grand student. He was uh, Ryan Eustace's student. Um, Matt uh, Perception, uh, we have um, a Caltech grad doing our planning and control. Uh, Luke, the guy from our DARPA challenge team, is leading our driver risk assessment. Adrian is a computer vision guy doing machine learning. Uh, then Gallus from Google Simulation. Uh, John Cloud, Tiffany UX, and Sharon is our amazing uh, uh, vehicle operations team leader, sort of, actually, so um, one of the biggest job opportunities I see in the next two day, decades is drivers for driverless cars. <laughs> Seriously, they are amazing people, they need amazing skills, and we, we're not going to get there without drivers for driverless cars. Okay, so briefly I want to tell you about Guardian and Chauffeur. So the idea of Guardian is that it's, it's a human driving, but with a sort of superpower safety system. And so you're fully responsible for the car. It's an automated, it's a safety, active safety system, but uses the tools of autonomy to do better. And, and to show you this uh, in practice, I want to give you, um, so, so back in, uh, to, so we've, we've had a sequence of prototypes. Back in 2017, after my first year on sabbatical, uh, we did some demonstrations on a closed track in Texas where we, uh, these are our Platform 2 prototypes, so Belladon LiDAR, a bunch of cameras, various other sensors. And my, um, I have three boys, my youngest is 13, and he, uh, I have pictures of him next to the DARPA Challenge vehicle when he was in a baby stroller, you know, one and a half. I brought him to Toyota like a few years ago, like sort of the Silicon Valley thing, free snacks, and I said, hey, do you want to see our driverless car? And he said, dad, seen one driverless car, you've seen them all. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, but actually, our driverless car is different. We start prototypes. We build a car with two steering wheels. And so why do we build a car with the second cockpit? So we have two decoupled driving systems with an autonomy stack. And the idea is you could have a safety driver in the conventional left-hand US driver's seat, the autonomy system that can take over, uh, and then a human driver that can drive under test. So this was one of our early prototypes. We have driver monitoring cameras. And I'm going to show you a little video clip with uh, Ryan Yates, Gil Pratt is navigating, uh, narrating, sorry, Luke's in the back of the computer. Uh, and, and we're going to tell Ryan to fall asleep. And just to, to try to um, show you how a Guardian system might work. So now we're going to demonstrate our Guardian system. We're going to emulate what happens when a driver falls asleep. Guardian can tell by using a camera that's part of the dashboard. The camera can even see through sunglasses in order to see what the driver's eyes are doing or if their head is moving into a position that indicates they're not paying attention. So Ryan, whenever you're ready, why don't you go ahead and pretend to fall asleep. And now Guardian has stepped in, it's driving the car for you, and now it will offer at some point to give it back to you. Why don't you go ahead and take it now. So one more little scenario just to show the concept. One of the most frightening things that can happen on the highway is when a car in front of you switches lanes to avoid debris. You have very little time to react because your view is blocked by the car in front of you. We have sensors that can see significantly better than a human driver can see. The Guardian is going to take over where a car switches lanes in front of us in order to avoid debris. Here that car switches lanes, Guardian decides we have to switch lanes also and we avoid having a crash. Now Guardian has offered to hand back control, and Ryan has taken control back of the car. So today you've seen demonstrations of two basic technologies that the Toyota Research Institute is doing research on. This is all part of PRI's work to eventually build a car that can never be responsible for a crash, regardless of what the driver does. So the dream is to build an uncrashable car, you know, a car that's capable of causing a crash. So um, that was an early prototype in the subsequent year, and I won't have time to go through it all, but we, 
we, uh, that was sort of a discrete on-off control, and I obviously got to test the system, and it's really powerful when the car takes over and then it offers it back to you. So we came up with a system where you can press the brake all the way down and release it when it asks you, take control back, and sort of have this sort of teammate relationship with the car. Um, and the next year, um, Stanford has some amazing research on uh, drifting vehicles, uh, Chris Garrity's group, some of their grads. We worked on bringing in what we call envelope control, a little more um, where there's sort of a blend of the human and the machine, we did some demos where we would tell the driver, you try to hit the cones, and the car would not let you hit the cones. Because it's, uh, it's basically using its perception, its maps, and its sort of understanding of the situation. So if you, if you sort of, uh, uh, it, it defines as sort of this green magic carpet of a sort of safe drivable region. Um, so we put together a few different demonstrations of what this might look like as a sort of compelling prototype. Um, one of the things we did is we created a, a very tight slalom course where um, with this Lex model Lexus, um, it's very hard for a human driver to drive a slalom. So the first run through here, um, the human driver's uh, going to hit the cones. But then um, in the second run through, uh, with the Guardian enabled, the system sort of engages the, uh, takes, it sort of takes, uh, it, it blends the human and your machine inputs to, to avoid the obstacles. And so we did other things with the car popping out and various sort of things. Um, and so for our research, uh, and this, uh, we have this vision we call radical, robust autonomous driving, incorporating cameras and learning. And the goal is to sort of think about how would you, so Toyota sells about 10 million, 10 million vehicles a year, they produce a lot of data. Uh, can you do the mapping, onboard perception, machine learning, the driver state estimation, and then ultimately prediction, what's going to happen next. So we, uh, and um, let's see. So I think I should wrap up just a little, some samples of research. So this is collaboration with MIT with some of my colleagues. Uh, the technology is really now quite strong to, to do gaze detection and look where someone is looking. Uh, and, so, uh, and so imagine if you're, so one, one uh, topic of, for, for driverless cars are automated driving. For example, in, in a Tesla, they pretty much just use the steering wheel torque to know whether you're paying attention or not. Cadillac Super Cruise is a really awesome system where they look at your eyes and they can really do a good job even with sunglasses of knowing if you're paying attention or not. Um, this next video is a little fun. This is a MIT research of, of just like taking arbitrary gaze detection in the wild so that you can just say where is someone looking. Um, and this is just a little uh, example from YouTube. Um, and uh, so, so computer vision is pretty amazing in terms of what, what is possible. Um, some of my colleagues were working on detecting cars and images very robustly, um, taking single monocular images and getting depth out of it. So it's sort of as if you had a LiDAR, but just from a single camera. Um, and uh, some work here in Cambridge, this is like trained on driving data around Cambridge, where you can sort of predict where a person might go. Like, are they going to go left or straight, or just come up with the probability distributions for different driving paths. Uh, and so. So to conclude, uh, I remain a contrarian for self-driving. I'm very optimistic that we can make cars safer, but in terms of the full self-driving, I think it's going to take longer, um, at least in terms of the proposed timelines for massive widespread deployment, or um, especially predictions made by Elon Musk. <laughs> so, uh, uh, the key question will be where, not when. So uh, it's going to proceed more gradually, incrementally, in different areas. Uh, and uh, any fundamental research challenges remain to be investigated, such as really doing the semantic slam in very dynamic environments, and then really being able to couple perception robustly uh, to control the planet. So I think I'll stop there and take questions. <laughs>
has an, an automated car division, then you may be able to do it. But until you take the environment and make the environment respond to you, rather than having to look at it as a problem, I don't think you're going to get anywhere. So you mean like dedicated lanes and infrastructure? Well, to say, you, the highway department has an automated car division. And so, so the highway department is saying, well, what do we have to do to make right. the process as possible? Mm -hmm. And that's the thing, so like traffic lights and, and so uh, the, the whole question the, the, the detour, the guy yeah. having detours and so forth. I think the whole question of infrastructure um, is, is really a great question. In fact, someone who'd be a wonder, I recommend as a wonderful speaker, if you've not seen him, is David Mendel. He's a, uh, he co-chairs the task force on work of the future, but he's a startup called Humatic, which is working on infrastructure, like using wireless ranging technology. And so there probably is ways to make cities safer with infrastructure, and I, and I do believe in that. One thing I wonder about is uh, you haven't talked about the quality of the experience for the people in the car. And wondering what kinds of human factors issues come up. That's a great question. I think um, the uh, I think it's an important thing for to, to research on. And there's a way that humans can produce a sort of a natural ride quality that's perhaps not yeah, that needs to be factored into your algorithm. Um, sometimes I joke that you know it's easy to when you've been in a self-driving car, like going back to 12 years to the DARPA challenge. I was doing endless laps around these course parking lots and checking emails and just you forget that you're in a driverless car kind of thing. Um, but if um, in, in, in general, I think uh, it's hard, it, it's very important to think about that sort of ride quality aspect. So I think companies do try to factor that in, but just, but you're right, it's very important. Yeah, my question is, how about, how about like, Looking, you're looking out, right? But you're not looking at the ground or things like material level changes with the ground. Like you're going to dirt, the uh, potholes. Yep. You got uh, slick roads. Yep. And how do you how do you work around that? I mean, because the weather in New England is the worst. You know, changes going, and the highways are always a problem, and so are the side roads. So I'm just wondering about that. How does that work? So a few things. I think. Um, we need better sensors, and so you can imagine having sensing technology that can better predict and understand the changes in the road um, and, and, and the friction coefficient. But um, I think, I'll point you to this researcher, Chris Gerdes at Stanford. He's done this wonderful work with an autonomous DeLorean, getting it to drift and do figure eights. And so that's sort of maybe stunt or show driving, but you can imagine um, if you had algorithms that could detect the new of the road surface and then you could sort of put in the design of a highly skilled human rally driver and then provide that to an ordinary driver, a teenager, an elderly driver in case they need it if something goes wrong. You know, that's sort of an inspiration. What, what are your thoughts on the specialty fleets? Like Rio Tinto has been operating mining trucks for a few years now. Uh, completely autonomous trucks. Uh, yeah. So maybe the core is difficult to penetrate, but the specialty fleets may be easier. I, I agree with you. In fact, I think like port automation. So my advisor at Oxford, a guy named Hugh Durant White, um, um, his wonderful friend, he moved to Australia specifically to pursue port automation and mining automation because of the size of the opportunity there. And so that that goes back to my sort of where not when. That you know there may be value propositions in these more specialized niche areas. Um, I think that's a, you're exactly right. What other ones you're seeing coming? Aside well, um, if you look at May Mobility and Optimus Ride as examples of small lightweight shuttles, that they, if you go 25 miles per hour or less, you have less stringent federal requirements for the vehicle design. Um, folks like I think Vonage Voyage are using looking at retirement communities. So imagine if you could supplement a transit system by providing a sort of a, a local air capability. One of the things about that main mobility would say is people hate waiting for the bus. So if you have a bus that can hold 40 people, but you have to have the bus come once, once an hour, what if you have a micro shuttle that can hold six people and it can come every five minutes and the economics work out similarly? So, so there's sort of micro locations, uh, retirement communities, college campuses, shopping areas. In Singapore, yeah. has a, this, a, a great, a substantial investment 
in, the, in their last mile kind of application. And uh, they, of course, it's a very restricted kind of environment. Uh, do, you, do you have a sense of where that, what kind of, what the learning is there and how that might uh, apply much more broadly? Singapore has actually been a pioneer. MIT has the SMART program with Singapore, where my colleagues Emilio Fatoli, Daniela Roos, they did some of the first pilots actually in Singapore. Uh, so I think uh, Singapore has uh, a sort of unique sort of um, infrastructure and, and culture where it's probably one of the best places to make it viable. So I actually haven't followed it the last few years, but I know that a few years ago they were they had one of the first running programs in terms of an experimental prototype. Please. Do, they, do you know offhand if they went from level four to level five, or they're sticking to, or are they always the drivers? Uh, or has anybody done that? Sure. So, to true, so Waymo have done limited operations with no driver in the car. That's still level four because of a restricted geofenced area. Nearly every operation that I know of still has safety drivers that take over, or car vehicle operators and vehicle technicians. Uh, Waymo have, have done some driverless runs in, in Arizona, and they're just announcing them in California. But it's still, my understanding, it's a small fraction of the rides. Uh, oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, well, I have what I would call kind of an ethical question. Uh, vehicles going down the road, pedestrian steps out in front, can't possibly stop. There's room to swerve around them, but there's a school bus coming. Do you run over the pedestrian or do you hit the school bus? So this, is, um, this is an example of what's called the trolley problem. So there's, an, there's a problem going back decades, I think first formulated by an MIT person, uh, in, in, uh, of uh, there's a trolley going down a track. There's a, there's a person on the track. Uh, sorry, there's say five people on the track, construction workers. There's a switch. You're an innocent bystander. Uh, and you could switch the track to get the trolley to go on the other track, but there's one person there. Should you throw the switch? And that's sort of this ethical dilemma. Um, it's, it's, it's a very challenging question to try to answer because it brings in lots of different ethics. But I'll say a few, a few thoughts that I think. First of all, my goal is to avoid the situation where the trolley problem comes into play. So if the car goes around a bend and there's a pedestrian in the crosswalk that is too late to stop, the car was going too fast. The, with maps and sort of superhuman project, prediction and perception, it should be possible to make a car that stays out of that situation. That's sort of goal number one. Uh, goal number two, in terms of being, well, answer number two, if the robot is in that situation, I, I think it's dangerous to sort of anthropomorphize the robot as sort of making a decision like a person would. Really, it's more, as engineers, our goals is to make the safest systems we can and test how those systems behave against sort of a valid statistical data. So it really comes down to how good is the pedestrian detection. And, and then, uh, you know, I think I, the goal is, it's really a very difficult question to answer because I don't, uh, we can't, it, it's really hard to answer. The goal is to avoid it, if that makes sense. <laughs> Sorry, uh, where's the... Yeah, whole, di whole different uh, industry, the railroad industry. Over the last few years, we saw you know trains run off the track out outside of Westchester in Pennsylvania. It always comes down to you know engineering error, too fast around the corner. And yet, the railroad industry tells us it's going to take two years and sixty billion dollars to make the change. And yet, it seems like you're on a limited, you're in a limited thoroughfare on a train. Can automated techniques be used for for railroad traffic? It's a great question. I, I, um, I have a colleague, she, former MIT colleague, Missy Cummings, is now at Duke, and she talks about uh, trains, planes, and cars, and the different sort of lessons and how they get deployed. And um, you could argue that auto, we really should try to automate the railroads first. Um, I think it points to the complexity when you need infrastructure. Who provides the infrastructure? Is it the city? Is it the state? Is it the federal government? Is it the company that operates the trains and maintains the tracks? Um, I'll point you again to David Mendel, his company, Humatics. They're working on wireless ranging technology that I, um, I, I'm, it's public, they're working with the um, subway systems where you could basically um, do ranging, uh, say, uh, to try to get very precision location information to then make the backup for if the driver is not paying attention. So I think, 
I hope that there there can be sort of synergies between the different areas. But I I, I, th I certainly uh, agree with you that trains should be uh, automated. Is there anybody looking outside of the autonomous view with regard to synchronicity regarding sensors external that the autonomous vehicle can read, so that nothing's blocked behind it because the sensors are preventing that from happening? Right. So there's technology they call V to V, vehicle to vehicle, and V to I, vehicle to infrastructure, where um, the um, federal government has worked in partnership with car companies for, for over a decade to try to do pilots of sort of smart traffic lights that communicate or cars that talk to each other. The reality is the rollout has been very slow because there hasn't been this economic incentive to cause it to happen at scale. But I think now you're starting to hear more about people designing smart cities. If you just look at how, um, you know, I'm a supporter of sort of the new bike lanes and better pedestrian crossings, even though it makes driving more challenging in Cambridge, uh, there's more of an investment in trying to uh, make cyclists and pedestrians, vulnerable road users, safe, safer. And I think that in that spirit, we should figure out how to monetize providing this uh, vehicle to infrastructure, ranging and communicating. It's technologically feasible. It just hasn't been economically viable for someone to do it. There's, there's ethics associated with it as well. It's, you know, putting sensors on things that otherwise would not happen without the autonomous vehicle, but uh, yeah, technology. So is someone going to walk around with a jacket with a sensor on them, or is there going to be a bicycle with a sensor on it? Or is there going to be uh, an animal running across the street with a sensor that's a pet? Or is there any other type of sensors external to the autonomous aspect, which you know, autonomously is looking at everything within itself and, it's, and trying to interpret externally what's going on around you. But without the external sensors, you really don't have the autonomy because you can't look beyond what's right. blocking. So, so I, for example, I've heard a Stanford professor say we should have people use apps to make them easier for the driverless cars to detect, like broadcasting signals. And I sort of would pause there and say, no, we don't, we don't want to force people, cyclists, pedestrians to change their behavior or make sure they have a charged phone and running some sort of app. Um, I think that the automated vehicles need to respond to the sort of world as it is, sort of you know, wear sandals rather than carpet the world. However, I, I think if you if you look at you know the sort of smart traffic the sorry the uh, countdown timer um, crosswalk light I say at Mass Ave um, at 77 Mass Ave you know it, this sort of knowing that it's 15 14 13 seconds to cross you know why not have every traffic light broadcast that timing information so that you can see in your dashboard. When I've said that, people have said, well, then you're just going to speed up when you know that it's, you know, <laughs> to get through the light. Yeah. So, so it comes down to human behavior. Uh, do, do you think Sorry. Yeah, uh, you think there might be a division between sort of the personal kind of car, which would have this protective angel on it, that would be affordable, and sort of the driverless Uber car that could cost $300,000, would have lots more sensors, and make it much easier for it to circulate around an urban area? Continuously, 24 hours a day. That's a great question, point that I didn't mention and probably should. If you think about this path, uh, paths to autonomy, there's a very big distinction between what we call POV, privately owned vehicle, versus what we call mass, mobility as a service. And so for a privately owned vehicle, like say Tesla with, with autopilot, there's a huge incentive to make the uh, sensors be, say, cameras instead of LIDARs, and to make the computation to be more reasonable, uh, because if it's something that someone's going to buy, they're going to finance, they're going to park in their driveway. Um, apparently the typical privately owned vehicle may only be used three or four percent of the time most, you know. Um, whereas for a mobility as a service application, think a sort of um, robo-taxi that's almost a continual operation, you could imagine having, as you said, a $300,000 sensor suite and that cost could be amortized over the operating life of the car. So that's why it's hypothesized that you'll see these more sensor-rich, uh, expensive mobility as a service or mass vehicles in these limited areas, whereas the applications for privately owned vehicles will use more uh, cheaper sensors and maybe be more safety 
first, kind of as safety, active safety systems. Hi, right here. Um, over here. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I, I'm curious that you haven't mentioned the liability factor of the OEMs as they create um, autonomous vehicles. You mentioned 30,000 deaths a year just in the United States. Um, nobody knows about them. We all know about the two that happened with autonomous cars. And those people are going to sue co car companies, and at some point it's going to be just impossible for them to, to, to manage that, that size. Can you talk about that at all, if that's come up with Toyota or well, anywhere I, else? So, so first of all, I should say I'm, I'm, I'm now just a technical advisor at Toyota, like, you know, so the day week when I'm teaching during the year. Um, but I'm, uh, the, I can't speak on behalf of Toyota in terms of its sort of the, the, the legal process. What I would say, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to quote um, what Gil Pratt says when he's asked this kind of question. So the true number for the U.S. is probably closer to 40,000 fatalities a year, um, sadly. And uh, people have said, how safe is safe enough? Like, what reduction would lead to uh, it being you know, worth it to bring in autonomy? And it's uh, some sort of technologists in Silicon Valley have said, 1% you know, better, we should do it. Um, I think Gil has said, and I support, that we really need multiple orders of magnitude improvement uh, in fatalities or injuries to make it worthwhile. Because uh, for a human to be responsible for an injury or fatality is very different than for a robot to be responsible ethically as a society. And so um, my answer is that we need to be much, much safer than a human. And we have to find a way to demonstrate that statistically. Um, and you can imagine if we had multiple orders of magnitude improvement, that then as a society we might make a decision to then, you know, uh, that this technology on balance is really worth it. Um, an analogy that comes to mind is the, the way the vaccine industry has a sort of a, a, a fund for the very rare cases when there are uh, adverse reactions to vaccines. It's very rare, but it's sort of a societally sort of accepted risk for vaccine technology. Can we get uh, cars to be as safe? That that's that would be my aspiration. Uh, where's the mic? I guess. Yeah. Can we get your prediction this evening as to when you think you'd be able to take a robo car to Logan in the snowstorm <laughs> in February? Uh, in the snowstorm in February, not in my lifetime. Uh, I don't know what that means. Maybe, maybe let's say. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, let's say, in good weather. Or, or, let me. That, that's a good prompt. I, I do have. I'll show you one more thing. Okay. Who's who's heard of a Mara's law? You know what Mara's law is. Do you want to tell us or? Can I? Long. Estimate in as far as technology feasibility, we often time underestimate. Yeah, good, good. So, <laughs> Mara's law, um, we tend to overestimate the effect of a technology in the short run and underestimate in the long run. You know, like mobile phones are a classic example. I guess Roy Mara was a technologist in Silicon Valley. Um, so, we're at the point where the sort of the linear projection of like the next three to five to seven years, I just don't see the radical change, the radical solving of some of these really hard problems to enable the, the trip to Logan in a snowstorm. Um, over multiple decades, I know that I'm gonna be wrong and that there is gonna be improvement. So maybe I should say 20 years, uh, 20 years. Um, You'll be alive. I hope so. Okay. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> You alluded to the fact ball. that uh, Elon Musk uh, dictated that LiDAR will not be in a Tesla. Uh, your opinion, is that an okay decision, a not okay decision, or a terrible decision? I like to hedge my bets. I work on multi-sensor fusion where I try to get the best from one sensor, the best from another sensor, and combine it. And so, if I would like to, I would like to bet on all the horses in the horse race. I, I kind of think, we need to pursue camera only or camera plus radar solutions to see what's possible technologically and to get it into cheaper vehicles. But I also think that for the applications like mobility as a service where LiDAR makes sense, we need to use LiDAR because just look at the picture of looking into the sun you know, at, at rush hour. Uh, any single sensor modality is gonna have shortcomings and challenges. So I think that 
for full autonomy, you're going to need LIDAR uh, in, the, in the short to medium term. Uh, computer vision is still too hard. Uh, where's the mic? Okay, hi. Um, hi. So I know your opinion of Google and Tesla and uh, some of the startups. I was wondering what do you think of some of the more traditional OEMs like GMS Cruise, which seems to be doing some good stuff, or it's got Argo, BMW is by far. Where do you think they are vis a vis like the Googles, the Optus Rides, etc. of the uh, world? I just have to. I have to acknowledge I, I am a consultant to Toyota, so I, I want to be careful. I love everybody. I love Ford. I, love Ford. <laughs> I was a General Motors scholar, and, and they paid for two years of my college at Penn, gave me a wonderful summer job, and then when I applied for a permanent job in 1986, 87, they had a hiring freeze, and so that's why I applied to grad school. So, so, I'm, so I'm incredibly indebted to GM. I worked in the factory home to Delaware. I, I'm indebted to Ford. I led the Ford M&T lines for four years. Um, I think that it's sort of a very, um, I, I can tell you something great about nearly every single player. I think it's actually a, a wonderful thing that's happening in terms of just there's, I'm a real fan of the technology and uh, I just am nervous it is gonna take longer. So uh, I, I would, yeah, I, I, I want to say something nice about everybody, if that's possible. Yeah, that's the same option. Thank you. <laughs> uh, you mentioned driverless Ubers a uh, moment ago. I've heard it suggested that, that maybe driverless Ubers, if they were ever uh, feasible, would improve traffic in the Boston area. And all I can imagine is more cars driving around and some of them empty. And uh, it seems like a terrible idea. I agree with you. <laughs> I think uh, adding a bunch of empty cars to the roads uh, during rush hour I, I can't be a good thing. I, I think when the Red Sox are in town, I walk across the Mass Ave Bridge to the T and I'm walking past all these cars that aren't moving. Yeah. But um, yeah, but I think uh, I I personally believe safety and providing mobility to the elderly, to the disabled, uh, to the, you know visually impaired, those rank to me higher than um, you know in terms of like any economic model based just on pure just replace a human. Uh, those don't tend to work so well in my experience. Uh, I could go on on that, but I don't know. Any more questions? Uh, where's the mic? Uh, um, I'm, <laughs> uh, I'm wondering, what are your thoughts on Tesla's Smart Summon feature, which just came out in the last few weeks? Has that changed your outlook at all? Um, I haven't followed it too closely. I've never used it or tried it. Um, I've looked at some of the video compilations online. I've got some on my laptop, but I'm not sure if I should play them or not. But uh, I, I encourage you to look at the videos. Like there's an NBC video uh, for compilation. I guess, uh, is it a convenience feature? What, what? Yeah, it's, uh, it's mainly a convenience feature for. I mean, I've seen it, but I just wonder why. What's the point, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think like get if it's hard to figure out bringing your car to you, so you don't have to walk through the rain. Um, for mobility impaired users, maybe if you've got hands full of groceries or screaming kids, it can be useful. I just worry about what can go wrong as an engineer, and so um, I. I uh, it's. Um, uh, and it, it's interesting. It, it's a good thing to talk about over a beer. <laughs> This is a question sort of about the fragility of the systems. The most recent issue of Nature had an article about the fragility of deep neural networks and for vision and image classification, which a long article basically boiled down to, we don't really know how these things work, so we don't fully understand you know, how sensitive they are to variations in images. Could you comment on that? Yeah, that's a really good point. So typically when, uh, so I have grad students that are writing papers now using neural networks to do mapping and navigation. 
Uh, and typically you'll train it on a data set and then you'll test it on a similar data set, maybe part of the data set that wasn't used for training. And you measure your performance statistically, and you can kind of adjust the parameters and a little bit, you know, get like the best results to try to get 1% better than the previous published work. But uh, there's something called transfer learning, where you, uh, you want to train it on one data set. For example, there's a very famous data set called the Kitty data set from Karlsruhe, Germany. <laughs> Hundreds, thousands of papers. You apply that to Boston data, and sometimes it gives you garbage. And so they don't know when they don't know. They can very easily give you really, so I could pull up in a second, uh, one, uh, I have a great answer to your question if I could pull up a picture, but I could find it quick enough. But I have Kitty data set trained on a different data set, um, and there's pictures of cars, pictures of bushes, labeled. There's a picture of a house identified as a train. <laughs> you know? uh, and so that's the kind of mistakes that they make. Now what I think an advocate like Jan McCullen, who recently won the Turing Award for his work along with Hinton and, and uh, Yoshi Bengio, they would say that the phenomenological experimental approach is sort of the head of the theory. Like we're still working on the theory, but sometimes that happens in science, that the sort of experimental approaches get, a, get ahead of the theory. So we're waiting on someone to come through with the theory. But part of me feels that there's an inherent fragility, fragility that won't go away. So you're exactly right to be concerned. Uh, I think we're going to have to uh, wrap up there for now. Uh, we've still got, the, still got the room, so people uh, feel free to stick around and uh, you know, keep some of these great questions coming, great discussion coming. And uh, I'd just like to uh, once again thank Professor Leonard for uh, spending this time with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Thank you.